Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of T-10. It's the show with 10-minute takes on the future of education and healthcare. And today I'm joined by Derek Borkowski. Derek, welcome to the show. Are you ready to dive in? Yeah, absolutely. I'm grateful for this chance to come on, Tim. It's always good to see you, my friend. Let's start out. Let's give everyone uh, an idea of who you are, what you do, and kind of how you came to be where you are today. Yeah, so um, so my name is Derek Borkowski. And I'm, my background, I'm both a pharmacist uh, and a software engineer. And so right now, these days, I'm wearing sort of both of those hats simultaneously as the founder of a medical information startup called Cosmos Health. And in particular, the product that we work on uh, is a website and mobile app called Pearls, which is a, um, it's a subscription-based website and mobile app where healthcare professionals can access uh, professional information ab- about uh, medications while they're doing their work or studies. I love it. And I, I do want to give people the chance to, to look up Pearls after this, but I, I know it would be helpful just because I do know you personally and your story. Um, I, I like to ask a question around how you think about education. And in this context, obviously you're building Pearls, but can we instead in, talk a little bit about what you did before Pearls and where education fit in in the pharmacy setting in particular, if you, if you don't mind just giving the high level on what you did and how you got the pearls beforehand. Yeah, so I say I wanted to be a pharmacist since I was in eighth grade. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of people have an idea of what they want to do when they're in eighth grade, but they change their mind as they learn, you know, new things and get other interests. And for me, it just, I was really fortunate. My my mom had worked at a local community pharmacy. I'm from rural Minnesota. And so when I would visit my mom at work and, you know, be in that environment, uh, that's how I got interested in pharmacy and just everything I did from eighth grade on kept reinforcing that interest. And so I hadn't really reconsidered any other sort of career path all the way through high school and undergraduate before going to pharmacy school. But it was while I was in pharmacy school that I actually got interested in technology. So I remember reading, I think like a lot, a lot of people have actually connected with this over. I remember reading Steve Jobs's biography, the one by Isaacson. And just being floored by it, being like, whoa, this is crazy. Um, I had never really heard of Silicon Valley or paid much attention to technology, but been like, are people still making technology companies? <laughs> and, you know, and then just sort of rolled over the whole rock of tech Twitter and venture capital and, and what's being done in technology. And so long story short, while I was in pharmacy school, I started learning programming, um, got interested in startups, digital health. And so w- while I was getting near nearer to graduation is when... Um, you know, I probably had the idea that I wanted to, you know, do something in, in com- to combine my healthcare knowledge with, you know, you know, with technology skills. And so it was actually during my last year of pharmacy school, while I was on clinical rotations, going from practice site to practice site, there's, I, th- I think, a really common misconception that the general public has is that your doctor or your pharmacist or your nurse has all the information memorized. And it's probably because of TV shows like Grey's Anatomy or House that that there's this misconception. But just like software developers refer to documentation all day, every day while they write code, uh, doctors, pharmacists, nurses, we also refer to professional information databases while we're learning in school on on clinical rotations and even in everyday practice, fully trained um, healthcare professionals rely on um, what's a billion dollar industry of tools. And so Pearls is another rendition of products in this space that allows clinicians to get faster information for making decisions in clinical practice, like looking up diagnosis criteria or double checking dosing of a drug before it's prescribed. So that's sort of a, uh, again, I hope that wasn't, didn't take too long there, but the high level of uh, how I got to where I am now. That's, uh, no, that's really helpful. That's great context for, for people. Can you, can you paint me a picture of, let, let's say that a, you are speaking to a, a patient and I know you've worked in a pharmacy setting and a patient has a question, they come in and you're interacting with them and there is something that you need to look up. How does that typically look? And, and can you describe kind of the, the without Pearl's version? So what are, what are most pharmacists who have been in your shoes or are currently in the shoes you were in before, how are they finding that information when a patient has a question? Yeah, so yeah, let me just, you know, for anyone listening, uh, we, we can do a little role playing scenario here. So you can, rhetorically uh, so you can pretend pretend you're a pharmacist in the pharmacy you know at your at your local you know corner drug or one of the large chains or if you'd like pretend you're a doctor in a primary care clinic sitting from across from a patient 
or last, you know, pit last pick your character, pretend you're a nurse in an emergency department and a patient, okay, for all three of these scenarios, a patient um, comes up and asks you a question about one of the medications they're on. Now, a really common scenario for healthcare professionals, especially when, if you have little context for this patient, is they'll ask you a question and you're about 80% sure of the answer. But in order, and so you have two options, really. You can give a patient an answer you're 100% sure of, but only sort of partially answers their question. Or, like you mentioned, you can take the time and do the research to get 100% um, confident in an answer to that patient's question. So, just like, um, you know, consumers, a lot of, oftentimes, places that healthcare professionals will start is either with Google, and they'll be looking up, you know, I'll Google a patient's question, and then, you know, given years of clinical practice, you know, uh, healthcare professionals are quite trained in what sorts of references that they should be looking at in Google search results, um, and, and, and what sites to cross-check with each other to be certain of an answer. Or we also have, there's a lot of, like I mentioned, there's a multi-billion dollar industry of professional information products that hospitals and pharmacies will license for um, healthcare professionals to look at. So some examples of these would be products called like UpToDate, or another product is called Clinical Key, or another product is called Lexicomp, Micromedics, Hippocrates. Um, again, the average consumer may not have heard of these names, but um, between professional references that uh, professional information databases and then searching the internet for you know, other, other results, the whole gamut is potentially what a healthcare professional might have to use to answer a question in that scenario. Okay. Yeah, that's, that is very helpful for me. Definitely understand that. Been in the patient side and rarely understanding the, the pharmacists when I had to go ask those questions. I, I want to know from your perspective when you've been interacting with patients and had to answer these questions, where do you see the greatest barrier as a pharmacist in the setting you're familiar with? So oftentimes when we talk to, say, a nephrologist or a nurse, it might be time, lack of time, lack of resources, or a lack of confidence in discussing those topics. You mentioned the 80% certainty. For some, that may be much lower, and they just don't want to have to do that balance. So for you personally, where do you see that, that number one barrier of the list, I'm sure, the lengthy list of barriers in education? But does one stand out for you? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, it's the amount of time that clinicians have to answer these questions. So let me, let me just speak to, again, that pharmacy scenario, which is most native to me and the users of the, you know, that my company serves. When you're a pharmacist and a patient asks you a question, whether on the phone or at the counseling window, in the background, you can hear one or multiple phones ringing. You can hear horns of cars honking at the drive-through. Um, you can hear the district, you can feel the eyes of the district manager on the back of your, on the back of your head um, as your metrics are getting worse. <laughs> exactly. And, and then lastly, you can feel the, the prescriptions piling up um, back at your workstation. And so one, frankly, that the amount of time in everyone, that's pharmacy you hear about, but you hear about, you know, doctors are always falling behind in their appointments because of the lack of time with patients. So really the ability to get information quicker is, is, is one of the largest barriers that we're trying to work on at least and that exists broadly. That's, that's really helpful. All right, let's talk about the innovation side of education for a second. And this is kind of what brings us into the, the latter half of this. Uh, I'm curious when you think about the innovation that is happening and you, you have a, a high level perspective now in your current seat course, what are you most excited about, optimistic about when it comes to innovations happening in pharmacy or in clinical education as a whole. And it doesn't just have to be what we've just talked about so far where point of care education, but is there any one part that you're following tracking that has you excited about over the next timeline horizon that the future of education? Yeah, you know, in my mind, um, when, when I think of other industries, innovation in like, let me just use like Netflix as an example. So they frequently, you know, refer to, they're always trying to find innovative new ways to take up people's time. You know, we're, they've famously said that sleep is one of their competitors because it takes away hours in the day. And I think with everything healthcare, the opposite is true. The best innovations come from things that remove friction. So this is a little bit adjacent to like healthcare education, but in my mind, one of the best healthcare innovations comes from the public health sector, 
when in the, starting in like the mid 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 uh, 20th century, we, municipal water supplies added fluoride to the water, and so that automatically improved millions of people's you know dental lives and and that and it didn't require anybody to do anything and so i think same with um you know education and information resources things that remove friction to getting information uh is is where i think innovations are really interesting one company that i would speak to in this space that i find really inspiring myself it's a company called infarmed it was started by another pharmacist uh in atlanta and anyway um a lot of academic institutions have drug information centers where they have teams of people devoted to doing literature reviews to answer uh, like really complex clinical or even edu- even an education setting questions. And so what this um, company does is they provide an app to doctors, pharmacists, and nurses that allows them to ask complex clinical questions and it routes it to a team of drug information experts who then will do a literature review and get back to the clinician with a detailed answer. I love that. I will follow up with you and find out the information for the, for the company to share with anyone listening who wants to dive in, because I know I personally want to find out more. There are a lot of parallels in, in our approach at Icona, so I appreciate that. All right, Derek, we're going to run into the, the end here. I have a couple questions for you. First, let's talk about on a scale from 1 to 10. I want to know how optimistic do you feel about the future of education over the next one to two years. I'm an optimist. Um, I, I couldn't say anything other than 10, um, especially given it's a space that I'm focused on and collaborating with so many people in uh, who I'm excited to be collaborating with. I love it. Okay, follow-up question. Same question, one to 10, but over the next 10 to 20 years. So take that long-term view. How optimistic are you feeling? I'm gonna give it another 10, but I'm gonna be relying on the good nature of people in this industry. One thing, certainly that's true about, there's a commonly cited study from around like 2010 or so that basically says like, you know, the amount of information, health information, like published studies and the research that's available doubles something like every three months, like the total body of evidence. So us keeping up with that is certainly going to, we're going to have our hands full, but but I'm optimistic. I am too. And I, I really respect and appreciate that. Last question for you here, Derek. Who is someone you're following or a podcast? or a series that people should be paying attention to that you're getting a lot out of these days and you think others would too, especially those who are kind of listening to this uh, education-focused conversation in healthcare. Yeah, you know, I guess the first one that comes to mind that's from an academic, certainly, not necessarily in the healthcare domain, but he's had healthcare experts on, is Tyler Cowen out of George Mason University has an excellent podcast called Conversations with Tyler, where he interviews a wide range of experts in business, academia, healthcare, um, he, and in all sorts of other domains. And so that's a, uh, really been a source of uh, inspiration and, and uh, information for myself personally. Perfect. I appreciate it. All right. Last thing here, Derek, where can people get a hold of you? How can they contact you and if they have questions or just want to connect after the conversation? Yeah, well, I would love to connect with anybody who's interested in talk more about health education or anything in healthcare. Find me on LinkedIn, uh, Derek Borkowski, uh, comma PharmD. I'm uh, I'm one of a few uh, with this name in the world, so it shouldn't be too hard to find. And would look forward to any conversation uh, with anybody who who has uh, has thoughts on this topic. Awesome. Well, thanks for diving in with us, Derek. It's great to have you on. Always a pleasure catching up. And thanks for spending some time with us today. Thanks, Tim. Mm-hmm.